Thank you, everyone. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about uh, domain-driven web applications using Backbone. Before, before we get into what that means, uh, let's take a look at this picture, because I think this is a, actually a really good metaphor for software development. Uh, so if you look off into the distance here, uh, you'll see this ship uh, that's just been launched, uh, and it's sailing away. But coming in at the top of the, the image here is the first plank that makes up the keel of the next ship that they're building in this dry dock. And so in a lot of the same way, like we build an application and we ship it, and before it's out of view, we're starting the next one. So what we need is a, is a sane architecture that helps us manage the constant turnover of projects uh, so that the next ship we build doesn't sink. So if we look at the last few years of JavaScript development, uh, we've really come a long way in JavaScript engineering rigor uh, on the client side. Uh, we've seen some of that in some of the talks today about test-driven development and uh, dependency injection and, and you know, how we, we architect our, our applications. Um, you know, we've, we've implemented all this stuff, static code analysis, testing, building. So why do so many of our applications still look like piles of coat hangers? Um, they might be well-modularized piles of coat hangers, uh, but they're still piles of coat hangers nonetheless. And so what we actually really need is an overall architectural design for our most complex applications. So I'm Bob Holt. Uh, as Adam mentioned, I work at Boku. Um, but before joining Boku, I worked at a large consulting firm specializes in clients and financial markets and energy companies. So these are the types of companies that need really big, really complex applications. Um, things like stock trading platforms or uh, how an energy company manages the flow of resources through their system. Um, traditionally, these are built in .NET or Java, um, some really historically solid server-side language. Um, but over the last couple of years, these applications have started moving to the client side. Um, you know, traders want to be able to make trades from the golf course on their iPad. Um, you know, we need web applications that can handle that. So what we wanted to do is we, we use uh, what we call do, uh, domain driven design on the server side, we want to be able to bring that same architectural style to the client side because our applications are no less complex and have no less um, you know, importance to our clients. And they need you know, data integrity and stability. So, but before we go any further, let's, let's be really clear. I'm not saying this is the one way to build applications. Um, this is a strategy. It's particularly suited to large data-centric applications. Other approaches really are equally valid. Um, we're going to see a very different approach tomorrow with Cujo. Um, just pick whatever architecture suits your particular application's needs, but please pick something. Um, but right now we're talking about domain-driven design. So this book came out in 2004. Uh, it defined an approach to software development that had been maturing, particularly in the, the Java world, for a very long time. So the first part of this book talks about theories and basic implementations of domain-driven design. And then the last part of the book actually goes into, you know, basically practice exercises of implementing, takes on some more advanced topics, talks about, um, you know, refactoring, and actually some software development best practices, how to work with teams, distributed teams, things like that. Uh, but today we're just going to cover the basics. So what is domain-driven design? Let's start by defining domain. So the domain is actually the subject of the program. Uh, in a lot of software, it's what we call the business of the software. So for example, in an airline booking application, the domain is actual human beings getting on an actual aircraft that exists in the real world. In stock trading, the domain's the universe of actual securities and real life exchanges and people on the trading floor who are actually trading these things. So domain driven design is an architectural pattern that places primary focus on this domain and its real world logic. Uh, DDD offers a collection of principles and techniques and best practices and all sorts of things that help us manage these complex applications that are built on this domain. But the question comes up, you know, what if my software isn't complex? 
So Eric Evans, who wrote Domain Driven Design, isn't even that dogmatic about using it. In his book, he actually suggests uh, putting all the business logic in the UI and shipping it. Um, you know, don't you don't have the time, the budget, the team capable of, of pulling this off if you're not building that complex of an application. So in short, <laughs> you just make it work. <laughs> So in DDD, we're really focused on managing complex software. Uh, and we take it kind of as a given that when we build complex software, it needs to be based on some sort of domain model. So what's a domain model? It's the image of the business logic and everything that ex actually exists in the head of an expert uh, in that topic. Generally, that's your client, uh, the business owner of your, uh, your client. Um, but this has nothing to do with the software at this point. And I'll say it again, it has nothing to do with software. So the domain model is conceptual. So in the same way that an economist is going to model an abstracted version of a real world system with math, we're eventually gonna do that with programming. But at this time, when we start conceptualizing this model, it's all theoretical. So let's start building a domain-driven application. So uh, we, we've used this as an example. So this is basically a screenshot from a, an application we like to use called Bulls First. It represents a very simple trading application. Um, it's a step up from a to-do a to uh, type of application, but it's still not a fully fledged operational thing that we would actually ship. So it gives us an opportunity to experiment with frameworks and um, you know, it, we've got it on the, the client side, we've got middle tier, and we've actually got back end. Uh, so this is a, a full end-to-end -end application that we've built. We can practice with different frameworks and clients and, um, and things like that. So we've done this with Backbone and DDD. So anyway, this is the, the application we're building, and you can see, you know, you can see your accounts, and you know, you click through and see your positions and make trades and things like that. So how do we go about building this? So the first step is to really settle on a framework. We want a framework that's going to support our domain-driven ambitions as much as possible, um, but that also includes staying out of our way when we want it to stay out of our way. So it should come as no surprise to anybody in this room that we like Backbone. Uh, I like Backbone. So I think Jeremy really summed it up the best in his blog post when he announced the release of 1.0. Uh, this is kind of a long quote, but um, when I'm building complex, customized applications, like this cannot be overstated, this importance of staying out of my way. Um, you know, when I build a new application, I'm going to do things differently every time. I'm going to set up the file system differently every time. Some of it's because I've learned something on a past project. Sometimes it's because I just want to experiment. But I don't want to be locked in by my framework into a one particular way of doing something. Um, and then building on that, anytime I try to do something with a more prescriptive framework, um, and then I, I often find myself running into something when I get to an application this complex that I try to go against what that framework wants me to do, it takes me about 10 times as long to get what I need done. Um, never run into that with Backbone yet, uh, so that's why I particularly love it. So we're going with Backbone, come hell or high water. Um, so let's talk about the process of starting to think through this domain-driven design. The most important step of the process is really the discovery phase. So in this phase, we're consulting with the, the business experts, project managers, business owners, to just build out this model that exists in their heads. You know, we use whiteboards and you know, text documents and, and things like that. Uh, and in doing this, we start to compile what we call the ubiquitous language. So this concept of ubiquitous language is shared um, among different software paradigms, but most notably with behavior-driven design. So ubiquitous language is a well-defined terminology that all members of the team use um, in all of their code, all of their documentation, all of their verbal communication, so that everybody who touches the product um, is speaking the same language, from the business analysts to the project manager to the developers. So instead of having to go back and explain to the client, you know, well, our database is 
relational and this and this and um, you know we're using the flyweight pattern in this way you know we're not going to use that terminology we're going to use the terminology we've discussed with them and settled on there's no translation involved everybody understands so in this application you know we don't necessarily have screenshots to start from but uh, you can see some of these important terms start to come out you know accounts and positions and orders and trade and transfer you know this is the process of building out this ubiquitous language when we say something, it's going to mean the same thing no matter what. And so we have a little cartoon example. Um, so the developer is actually talking to the business owner and trying to refine their idea of the ubiquitous language. Um, you know, we contin continue to iterate on it as we go along. So the developer says, hey, you know, we've got positions and an account and shares and security. And the business owner says, well, that's not the whole picture, you know, I'm thinking of lots and, you know, we need to calculate gain and see. So the developer says, well, you know, instead of horseshoeing this new information into the model I already have, um, which is pretty much what I think a lot of us used to do, uh, maybe still do, uh, we're going to actually take time and incorporate all this new information into both our mental model and our software implementation once we get down uh, the line. So this is an iterative process. Um, the domain model will continue to change throughout the project as we get greater understanding of both how the software implementation is being put together as well as how, um, you know, as we deal with it longer, the actual reality of the situation. So better abstractions and epiphanies and clarifications will cause us to continuously refine this model. So whenever I say iterative, the question comes up, does this mean agile? Not necessarily, as long as you are willing to make your model uh, iteratively perfected. Um, but you can definitely see how an Agile methodology would not only accommodate, but perhaps even encourage this process. So if we're continuously throughout the life cycle of the project, iteratively changing the, the data model, how do we do that without breaking everything? Well, we need to isolate this domain model from everything else. So. We want to think of our application as having different loosely coupled layers. So at the bottom um, here, we have our infrastructure layer, which is uh, a lot of our services, supporting framework, repositories. Uh, and then the next layer up is our domain layer. So this is our model, our data model. Above that, we have our application layer, uh, which is how our application particularly hums along. Uh, and then on top of that is our UI and our views. and um, in our instance, it's almost entirely made up of backbone views. So to preserve the loose coupling of this architecture, we want to keep these levels strictly separated. The levels above are allowed, but not necessarily encouraged, to have direct reference to the levels below. But that doesn't go the other way. So the levels below have to communicate up the stack with events. And so this, this really makes sense if you sit down and think about it. Why, if I'm building an application, should it care what UI is built on top of it? Why, when I'm formulating this data model, does it care what kind of application is built on top of it? Uh, whenever anything changes, it's just going to broadcast an event, and whatever application is there is going to catch that event and respond accordingly. And we can see the separation in like this example of the file system from that Bull's first application where you know, domain is obviously our domain model. What we call framework is our application uh, layer. It's got various utilities and base objects and um, things that we tend to use throughout our application. Pages and widgets are our views, uh, our UI layer. And then services, we're gonna talk about a little bit more later, but that's basically our infrastructure layer. Now, like any software application, we make concessions. This doesn't stay 100% pristine, um, but we have this platonic ideal of DDD that we're aiming for. And we can sacrifice this purity for maintainability as long as we are completely cognizant of it and know what we're trading off. So, we've got kind of a concept of our domain. Uh, we've got kind of our framework. Now we need to start expressing this model in software. 
So our biggest battle here is going to be against complexity. So in the real world, 100% accurate representation is going to be endlessly complex. There's this whole network of relationships between objects and um, you know, we can't replicate that in software. We don't necessarily want to because there are performance implications, uh, maintainability implications. So how do we simplify our representation of this domain model? Well, the first thing we need to do is kind of clarify this relationship. You know, like I said, in the real world, everything has a kind of many-to-many -many relationship. But we want to kind of whittle this down, um, clarify the relationship, and as we come to understand this domain model, many of these relationships can be simplified or even eliminated altogether to make the implementation of the software actually easier to produce. So once we've clarified a lot of these relationships, then we need to kind of start distinguishing between entities, value objects, and services. So entities are objects, and value objects are objects. But entities have identity. So you know, we need to keep track of a particular instance of an object throughout its entire life cycle, then uh, it's an entity. You know, it has an ID. We treat it as something particularly unique and wonderful and beautiful. People, financial accounts, uh, anything that has an ID is an entity. Value objects are objects, but they don't necessarily have this identity requirement. Uh, they're commodity objects. We can pass them as parameters. In messages, we can pass them, uh, attach them as attributes to other entity objects. So, for example, on, an, on most airlines, seats are entities. You know, they have a particular designation. But on Southwest, they're value objects because there's no particular designation. Uh, it's like general admission. Everybody gets whatever they get. Um, all we care about is the number on the aircraft. And finally, services. So services are part of the domain model that they're not really objects. They're, they're more actions. Um, for example, in a trading application, we might have an instrument service uh, that goes out and gets the current prices of all the stocks that we're tracking. Um, in our ubiquitous language, stocks are instruments. So it's an instrument service that goes out. So the service doesn't maintain state. It just goes what it does, it fulfills its action, and it forgets. Uh, it waits for the next command. All right, so we have objects that are entities, value objects, and services. So we have a couple more things to do to implement our domain-driven design. So if we don't think about it, we might just start taking all these objects and putting them together and you know, clarifying their relationships and sticking them all together uh, and set them up as a bunch of objects that have whatever relationship. The problem is that part of our application might change one object state at one point while another part of the application changes another object state at a different point. Or if we're being really naughty, we might have different parts of the application change the same object state at the same time. Um, so when external parts of our UI uh, application layer start modifying different parts of our domain model at different times, it becomes impossible to maintain data integrity. So the solution is to really wrap up related objects um, based on how, you know, how closely they're related uh, in our domain model, and then give them one point of entry. So external objects can then only reference any of these objects by passing through what we call the aggregate root. So we wrap them up as an aggregate, and then all external application logic can only query positions, orders, lots, or transactions through the brokerage account. So basically, I would say brokerage account dot get positions, and it would give me the collection of positions. Um, and this is actually relatively reflected in the JSON that we're getting back from the server, you know, when we query for an account. You know, I'll get an account, and it'll have a list of positions, and it'll have, for each position, the number of lots. So it, it kind of makes sense, and that's an easy way on the client side to break that stuff up. But um, maintaining this integrity is um, So once we've got these aggregates, we need to manage their life cycle. And we do that through this concept of repositories. So in, in domain-driven design, we use repositories to hand, handle kind of the mid-life cycle of our objects. Objects are created, they exist on a server, 
we're just getting their current state and representing them in the application. So the repository caches data as necessary uh, and either serves it back directly on a query or it goes out and gets it from the server, which is kind of like the, the promises pattern Jeremy showed this morning. Um, you know, it's possible for the repository to, you know, know whether it's already gone out and get something uh, and presents the latest version. You know, in a trading application, we don't necessarily want to do that because we always want the most current application from, or most current data from the server. So in domain-driven design, this is the responsibility of this repository object. But in Backbone, our models and collections have fetch methods. Um, so we're not going to fight against that. So one of the things, uh, again, in domain-driven design is that it's a platonic ideal that a, relation, that a repository has this one purpose. Um, but since we've chosen our, our framework, we're not going to fight against that. So we're going to use Backbone's model and collection fetch methods. Um, and the repository basically just delegates to those if as necessary. So the, the other part of the life cycle of objects we need to maintain is, is the beginning. How do we create objects? And we do that through factories, which is, again, a design pattern, getting a four, um, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, so repositories return these already existing objects, but the factory creates a new one out of whole cloth. So uh, if, for instance, I have an application that builds cars, you know, and I say new car, and I pass in a bunch of attributes, it will create a new car object for me. Um, again, you know, Backbone can do a lot of this for us. So we have collection.add, uh, model.validate to, to help us build out new objects, add them to our domain model, uh, and validate that they're actually correct. So thank you very much, Backbone. Um, So this really all just scratches the surface of building domain-driven applications. And I haven't actually shown any code, um, so if you're hungry for that, that, again, if that's your thing, sorry. Um, but I, in domain-driven design, I, I'd really argue that architecting uh, a complex piece of software, DDD or no, is, is more of like a, a philosoph philosophical exercise. Um, it comes down more to how we think about the problem and approach it. Um, more than how we code it. So when you when you come across a new application, especially if it's fairly complex, don't start coding. Um, you know, take a cue from this guy and think about it for a while. Um, I sometimes have to sit on my hands uh, because I really want to like, oh, this is great. I'll start building this object, and that's guaranteed to be a mess. So maybe you use domain-driven design. Maybe you don't. This was a really quick, brief introduction. Um, maybe use Backbone, maybe you don't. But whatever you do, just figure out what you're going to do before you do it. Um, and try not to get a, a mess of code hangers at the end. So uh, I'm Bob Holt. Thank you for listening. My slides are available here. Uh, the source of the slides are there. And then if you want to really dig into the code uh, of our implementation of that training platform, uh, we have links here. Thank you very much. I definitely have time for questions. Do we have any questions for Bob Holt? Yeah, um, so when you're talking to clients and you're trying to understand um, their business and, and the processes and all that kind of stuff, how does like a visual designing, paper prototypes, how does that part of the process fit into helping you actually model all of that kind of stuff? So ideally, when you're developing this domain model and you're talking it out with the client, every stakeholder you know, from the client side is there, every person who's going to be involved in building the application from visual design to um, UI design, uh, user experience to the developers, everyone is a representative at least of everyone is in the room. So when you start talking about this model, you know, the visual designer has as much input and 
question asking ability as anyone else in the room. Um, and it often helps to have a visual designer there because they're really good at whiteboarding stuff. <laughs> um, I can't whiteboard or anything. Um, but <laughs> so yeah, I mean everybody who has a stake in this has a voice in this, uh, and that's a very important part of the discovery process. Anybody? Okay, this might come out a little bit messy, but um, watch, hearing you talk about uh, the repository interface and sort of being a centralized, um, cent centralizing the management of uh, fetching um, domain objects, uh, seemed very similar to sort of I think some of the points that Ryan was emphasizing this morning about not you know, not directly calling fetch, for instance, and, and having some interface that manages all that for you. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about the way in which the two approaches are similar or different, or? Yeah, and so. Maybe, maybe not at all, too, but. Yeah, uh, so unfortunately I missed Brian's talk, but I, the way a repository works in our application is that or would in, in domain-driven design, because um, again, in this application, we actually want the data fresh every time. So we have a method, um, actually, let me see if I can just show you. So this is the repository. Um, actually, oh, you can't see it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here I actually want to rewrite, um, because I think it's not necessarily correct. Um, but basically we have this repository and we have get, you know, get user, get credentials, get whatever. Um, in theory, this would either cache, so it would go get it, you know, if it didn't already exist um, on the model, it would go and get, or if the models, or if the collection was empty, it would go fetch, uh, save that to a cache, you know, um, and then, you know, the next time you, you call this method, it would check if it had been cached, and then if it hadn't, it would go back to the server and return a promise and, uh, you know, do it that way. So, I don't know if that's... Yeah, no, they have a, a it. So all that would be built in the repository, and the repository then would delegate out, if it needed to get that data, delegate out to the fetch method on the model or, or collection in this case. Thanks. Anybody else? Any questions? Everybody want to take a break? Um, let's give it up for Bob.